Well, for that extremely kind introduction and for the opportunity to address you. Um, uh, so I have this question, the role of government. Uh, I'm going to assume that most of you are here because you basically believe in freedom. You believe in individual prosperity, but fundamentally you believe in life, liberty and property. Um, in any given year I find myself talking to lots of different groups and if you're freedom minded and you're in the United Kingdom, you can actually come from all kinds of backgrounds or tribes. You could be a free market conservative, you could be a libertarian, you could be a self-styled narco-capitalist. I once used the phrase narco-capitalist and someone misheard me, they thought I said narco-capitalist. <laughs> Excessive drug users. You could be a classical liberal. You could be on the orange book side of the Dems. You could be someone who's a mutualist, someone who's a great fan of the cooperative. Whatever, I'm going to assume for the purposes of today that you're part of the freedom minded family. I take it as a given uh, when John made our case, and many things that of course, I disagree with Clinton, but he did say something that I think is very, very important. He said, and I quote, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they're right and when they're wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves to some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler a few years back. I'm sure that the power of vested interests is vastly exaggerated compared with the gradual encroachment of ideas. And I'm standing before you as someone who takes ideas very seriously. And it's on that basis, and mindful of where most of you are probably at. Did I stand before you today? You're, you're probably, most of you are either, uh, uh, some of you might be in the sixth form, some of you might be undergraduates, some of you might be postgraduates, but you're here because you're interested in ideas, and you're interested in teasing out from a freedom-minded perspective for these questions. You like ideas. My starting advice, if I can put it this way, or my way into thinking about the role of government is not to stand here and preach so-called truths, but it's to start from the position of giving you some advice. When you attend to the question, or when you go on to listen to me in a minute, when you listen to Jamie, be mindful of the phase of your life that you're in. For your futures, when you think about this question or others, build firm intellectual foundations. Be intellectually inquisitive and open to new ideas. Perhaps, for most of you at this stage, avoid labels or factionism. Don't fall into the pigeonhole trap. Don't sit there thinking, hmm, now I'm an anarcho capitalist or libertarian or classical liberal orange booker who's got lots of friends on the free market wing of the Conservative Party. That's all great fun but really read a lot, soak ideas and, and, and debate, and debate across the pigeonholes. I think that we're living in interesting times. We must be living in interesting times in the economic sense, because in the last 24 hours, the Swiss central bank has intervened to tie the franc to the euro. The Greek government just managed to sell some of its debt yesterday, but in doing so, the banks were, were mandated to buy it. And this morning, national savings in the United Kingdom withdrew some of their index-linked products, according to the BBC. So we're living in very interesting and turbulent times more familiar 
with the difficulties of recent years. But there are two ways of looking at things. I think out there the majority opinion is still that there's been an awful lot of market failure. There's, there's been too many greedy bankers that this is the anarchic market gone wild. I think there's also a flip side to that, which freedom-minded people should be mindful of. Do we really live in a free market society? Is it the market that's gone wrong, or has there actually been state failure? And my mother, bless her, she might watch this on the internet, so I've got to be careful. If my mother looks at a BBC news report and sees the Bank of England, and a BBC journalist in front in a suit or whatever, a smart clothes, my mum will tend to think that's the essence of the city and the market. But of course, the Bank of England is a central bank. It's a nationalised central bank. And at its heart, it has a Soviet, I mean, I mean, it has the Monetary Policy Committee. In your pocket, you have nationalised monopoly fiat currency. You know this because the head of state has her image on it. The pound is not the pure juice of the wonderful and prosperous market. It is perhaps an outlier of a more Soviet society. What's interesting in all these questions is how do you look at it? Market failure or state failure? And I think, I suspect, I know where most of you are coming from. Like me, you believe an awful lot about the current financial woes are because of state failure. They're because of legislative failure to banks. Okay. The role of government. What I'm really interested in doing is getting to the bottom of things and looking at where the difficulties in answering that question. I'm assuming that most of you kind of support the idea of a market in education or a market in healthcare. Most of you are not going to be that impressed with the idea of a 50p income tax level and all the other things that almost provide us with a shared understanding. But what about the fact that we're living in a country where the police were nationalised in 1829? And if you read Hansard of that time, many on the conservative benches were up in arms about a nationalised police force. They thought it would lead to inefficiency, a loss of liberty, and many of the things that some of you might think have indeed come to pass. One of the things you don't hear from opinion formers, or too many journalists, and I speak now as a former guest lecturer at the National Police Staff College, is that you today are living in a country where for every one state policeman or woman, there are already three private security guards. On some estimates, 4 or 5% of the US population are now living in essentially privately policed or gated communities. I'm not saying this is good or bad, but I'm saying it's interesting and it provides us with conundrums. I'll give you a conundrum. I have a friend who was actually the chief executive of one of Britain's largest private security companies. He was very innovative when it came to privatisation of prisons. And I said to him a few years ago, have you ever thought of private beat patrols for areas? I mean, already in London, there are places like Connaught Square or places in Chelsea where there are private security beat patrols where people pull together because they're worried about crime or whatever and they buy a private service. This man said to me, hmm, I've never wanted to go down that road, Tim. I said, why? 
And he said, have you ever been to Disneyland? And I said, yes. And he said, well, there are 700 private security guards in Florida on Disney's near sovereign corporate territory. And when you go there, if you drop bubble gum, or you do something wrong, that area, Disneyland, is rigorously policed. And that's true, I've been there. And I've since spoken to Disney World Security. And he said, you know, Tim, if I really had the contract to police areas, bad states, rough areas or whatever, we would do it so well that perversely, you might have that Disneyland feeling, that feeling of a degree of unfreedom. You might be safer, but you might not necessarily feel free. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Because I had been to Disneyland, as I said, and I, I felt I was very safe, but I didn't particularly feel as free as I might wish to. And that raised a question in my mind. Under our nationalised police force, I think the crime clear-up rate, if you're lucky, is seven or eight percent. It's 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 rather low. But it's actually part of my sense of freedom when, for example, I walk through a street late at night or whatever, to do with the state failure of nationalised police services. Often people say, oh Tim, you could never have private police or private law enforcement because it would never work. And the implication is it would never be strict enough or rigorous enough or people wouldn't feel safe. Maybe there's a more interesting argument in the opposite view. You can look at healthcare. And popularly in this country we talk about private healthcare versus the NHS. Yet below the surface you can see that all health services in Britain have an underlying monopoly. They have many underlying monopolies. One of them, for example, is the General Medical Council. If you want to be a doctor in Britain, you actually come under a statute of Parliament that gives the GMC power, and they centrally design, they plan what it is to be a doctor and not. And you have to do your seven years of training, and you have to go to one of their recognised schools, etc., university medical establishment. If you were medical students and you were in the seventh year of your studies and you were out there on the wards and all the rest, and some of you said, you know, we could produce better doctors, cheaper and faster. We could do it in four and a half years. The underlying monopoly and its legislative favour would not allow you If I said go and produce a, uh, motor cars, you know, compete with each other, go and design motor cars, let's have a market in motor cars, okay, fine, you know, fine. Oh, just one thing, guys, um, here's the blueprint, this is what it's got to look like, they've all got to be up, you say, well, that's not a market. Yet we live in a world where too many people on the side of freedom think that a private healthcare company is again the pure juice of the free market. And I'm suggesting otherwise. So what is the role of government? Well, my answer is, that's incredibly difficult. It's very difficult. I don't think there are any easy answers. But I think at where we are now, in the world of huge debts, deficits, banks threatened, and all the rest of it, it is extremely timely to ask the question. And in all kinds of ways, and in all kinds of areas, banking, money, policing, healthcare, education, and many others, to strip down, to drill into, to go below the surface of the normal conversation that you have between the Guardian or the Telegraph. So I'm not here today to tell you what the role of government is. I'm not here to tell you what the role of the market is. I'm here to whet your appetite. And I'm here to raise conundrums and questions 
that I think would be really useful for you to explore. And I'll give you one example. In my humble opinion, the world's best academic on the history and realities of private policing, private law enforcement, is Professor Bruce L. Benson in the United States. Gloriously, a lot of his material is on the internet. I think that, as in the future, we question more and more what the role of government is, it will be incredibly useful to have young people, to have graduates, and to have tomorrow's opinion forms, having read that material, debated it. So, when you look at the question, what is the role of government, go out there and look at the radical literature and think all the phenomena around me, even when something is often called private or of the market, is it really? And as I get older, and you get older, and you get wiser, and you read more, come and tell me what you think. Because like me, you're on a journey. Thank you.